Welcome to A225, STS042. Um, <clears throat> just a quick announcement. Hopefully, you saw the message also uh, through the Canvas um, course site as well. We're going to do a similar routine for this coming week as we had done earlier this week, which is to say, um, students' main assignment for <clears throat> Monday's class session is coming Monday is to watch on your own time at your own schedule, at your leisure, uh, another documentary film. This is also about <clears throat> a little less than 90 minutes, so it's comparable to a class session time. This film is called Containment. It was made by uh, Peter Gallison, some of whose work we've read before, and some of his colleagues worked on the film. And it's, um, it takes some, some of the threads we've been talking about even further up uh, more, more recent in time. Uh, I think it's a fascinating, very again, very um, engaging, at times very troubling uh, documentary. And so the main assignment is to watch that. So for today, it'll be a more, uh, more familiar style uh, class session. I have a bunch of slides. Um, so I wanted to, to, uh, to carry this, the story forward a bit further in time uh, compared to just the developments immediately during the Second World War, which we've been kind of focusing on for several class periods in a row. And so today is looking in, into the period that came to be called the Cold War and looking at some aspects of uh, nuclear questions during the Cold War, much, much more beyond that that we can't cover in detail in class. But I want to at least introduce some things uh, along the lines we, we've already been, been talking about. <clears throat> so today, there's, as usual, almost always, there's three main parts uh, to the class. We're going to start by talking about what did people mean when they talked about this phrase, the atomic secret? And as we'll see, that gets bound up with questions about both uh, espionage uh, and possible implications of espionage during the Second World War, and also about what's called proliferation. Other countries besides the United States or the immediate US, UK, Canada uh, partnership during the war uh, that, that led to the Manhattan Project. How, how and when did some other countries begin to develop their own nuclear weapons? Uh, and that's the first, that's that whole bundle of, of themes and topics we'll talk at least briefly about for the first part of class today. Then we'll talk um, about the US decision to actually pursue uh, a different kind of nuclear weapon, the, the hydrogen bombs or fusion weapons. And again, you got uh, some of this uh, introduced near the end of the film, The Day After Trinity. And I'll just talk a bit more about, um, about how those decisions played out uh, in, in the US context. And then the third part was pretty quick, but I just wanna make sure we all know that the policy challenges uh, posed by nuclear weapons uh, hardly disappeared in 1945 or 1950. So the last part will be a look at some of the uh, international treaties that sort of came and went um, over the longer period beyond uh, just the 1950s, uh, stretching into, into uh, later into the Cold War. So that's really just a kind of um, much briefer sketch, just to, just to make sure we're clear that these issues really did have a very long uh, a long tail, and in, in fact, of course, many of the issues uh, have, uh, are still relevant to this day. That's where we're heading today. So, <clears throat> as we saw uh, both in the previous uh, uh, lecture and also, I think, very evocatively in the film, The Day After Trinity, the Manhattan Project was this really kind of unprecedented, sprawling scientific and technical project, ultimately employing about 125,000 people at 30 or maybe 31 sites uh, distinct sites um, across the United States and uh, parts of Canada. It was just enormous. It included some of the, at the time, world's largest factories ever constructed at all, and some of those at the uh, isotope separation plants in Oak Ridge. Likewise, the billion cubic feet or cubic meters, billion cubic something uh, of, of concrete poured at the Hanford site. Uh, to host these enormous, enormous uh, nuclear reactors to do things like create kilograms of plutonium instead of only micrograms. Just a reminder, this was, this was a project on an unprecedented kind of industrial scale, as well as involving lots of uh, complicated questions for science and engineering along the way. So <clears throat> that work was done uh, in secret during the war. And as I mentioned briefly, some of those sites like Oak Ridge and Hanford were literally not even on the map uh, at the time, they were the 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 existence and the location of the sites was considered too sensitive to put even on simple uh, maps of, say, the state of Tennessee, for example, for Oak Ridge. But the secrecy was was some part of the secrecy was removed quite dramatically at the end of the Second World War, 
when the nuclear weapons were used against Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And suddenly this was uh, in you know, worldwide news, no longer only top secret. So what I was curious about a number of years ago, and I wrote an article that um, you know, was part of the readings for today, was how did people react to what had previously been treated as very, very top secret once the fact of the weapons uh, was no longer a secret? And so the way to think about that uh, that I pursued was what did people mean when they used the phrase the atomic secret? They use that phrase all the time, uh, especially in that first decade after the end of the war uh, in all kinds of settings. Um, and media, what did people mean? What do they think the term, the atomic secret re referred to? And one thing I wanna prime us for uh, just days before the next election here in, in our current days, is that a lot of these discussions, maybe not so surprisingly, were kind of unfolding uh, in the midst of and re reflective of um, domestic politics. Not only domestic, there are lots of international things going on as well, but a lot of the rhythms of what changed, what kinds of conversations seem to, to um, to dominate it at different times, I think we can make sense of that by thinking about a timeline of domestic, often electoral politics. When's the next congressional midterm, especially when's the next presidential election? How are those elements of a kind of familiar US rhythm uh, of public discourse? How are those wrapped up with some questions that on the face of it didn't seem to be tied up with uh, in, a, in, a, in an obvious way with those kinds of um, uh, political jockey? So the very first res public response that got a lot of play uh, in literally days and weeks after the news about the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, their first response was, there is no secret. The response to the question, what's the atomic secret was to say, there is no secret. And that was especially um, um, uh, kind of uh, advocated or, or promulgated by a group that came to be called the Federation of American Scientists, or the FAS, their very first title was the Federation of Atomic Scientists. And this <clears throat> uh, included many, many folks who had been at various wartime Manhattan Project installations, including Los Alamos, but also at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, less so at Hanford, though some, and also at the Met Lab in Chicago. And they uh, very soon after the war founded a journal that's <clears throat> still around today, just celebrated its 75th, 75th anniversary, called the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. This was really a kind of lobbying effort, I mean, by their own terms. Their, their, their goal was to do kind of educate members of the public, including politicians and journalists and other policymakers, but also sort of American citizens and voters more, more generally about what they thought everyone should know about the new nuclear age. And their first response, which got a lot of media play, literally starting in sort of September, 1945, was that there is no secret which is to say, uh, there's no way to keep these things, uh, the unique possession of only the United States, that uh, many, many countries with advanced industrial capabilities and smart scientists uh, can and very likely will uh, develop their own weapons because there is no single thing you could lock down to stop to prevent them from doing it. A related version, a kind of a variation on that theme, which again, got a lot of kind of airplay in op-eds and newspaper editorials in magazine features and, and so on, was that there had been one secret, but that's no longer a secret at all. The secret was given what we know about say, the behavior of uranium nuclei and slow neutrons, the secret that remained was, could such a thing ever be built? Could a nuclear weapon that uh, released its energy from the runaway chain reaction of fissioning nuclei, was that physically possible? And now that's not a secret because it had been demonstrated uh, quite dramatically and very publicly that such a thing was possible. So that's a, that's a kind of variation on the theme that there is no secret, or we'd say, well, the secret is now out. If there was a secret, it was that it could be done and that's no longer a secret. Um, and again, I, just to, to remind us that was, um, uh, that message was 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 being deployed not in a vacuum. It wasn't being articulated only for a sake of kind of public information, though that was part of the earnest goal of many of these organizers. But it was also in the midst of some very, very heated uh, politically divisive debates within US Congress, within um, you know, the kind of among the punditry, let's say, or the commentators, about what to do in this new, suddenly new post-war world about atomic energy about nuclear reactions generally. And there were two, very quickly, like within weeks of the official Japanese surrender, there were two competing bills introduced into the US Congress with very different proposals for what to do after the war. 
basically what do you do with the Manhattan Project is what it really came down to. Should there be, uh, both, both these bills assumed there would be some con continuation of something like the Manhattan Project. The, an option that was not on the table was shut it all down and walk away. That was not considered in any serious way at the time. So instead, the, 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 what seemed like the relevant options, what were reflected in these dueling pieces of legislation or proposed legislation, was number one, continue on something like the World War II basis, meaning uh, explicit military control. The Manhattan Project, as you may remember, was um, really overseen by the, by the War Department vis-a-vis -vis the Army Corps of Engineers. It was a, that's why General, the Army General Leslie Groves was the ultimate head of the Manhattan Project even though he had many scientific directors working with him. So option one was continue that, that there should be uh, basically war department or soon a defense department military control of a kind of post-war version of the Manhattan Project. Um, and the competing bill was to have a civilian agency. As I said, there was no bill that said, let's have no atomic project moving forward. So it was basically, should there be continued military or a shift to a civilian agency control of uh, anything having to do with nuclear reactions, whether it's for reactors for power generation or for weapons. And these discussions about is there an atomic secret or not, those are being kind of deployed in, in, in the context of a very concerted political fight over these very different visions for, um, for the legislative future of atomic energy. So we don't, we, we don't be careful not to read these editorials kind of in a vacuum. There was another phase, and this is what I write about a bit more in, in that article, that didn't just stop by saying there is no secret. And so here it was really interesting uh, to look at what were, th what were kind of widely circulating often quite influential kind of requoted um, uh, statements either by scientists or by journalists or by policymakers, including things like congressional testimony, but also in broad circulation magazines um, of people articulating other answers to that question, what is the atomic secret? And what I found really interesting, I didn't expect this going in, when I was starting this, this work, was that in this several years after the end of the war, really right through late 1948, there was a pretty distinct pattern to these, to these next set of responses. That even when people said there does exist something called the atomic secret, the nature of that secret, these, these, all these different kind of observers seemed to agree or be consistent, the nature of those secrets had to do with kind of industrial capacity, with materials, with how do you build factories that work? It was not about, it was explicitly not about kind of single formulas or text-based information that could at least in principle be sort of smuggled out or aid some rival nation. That it was about large scale industrial uh, processes like how do you pour a billion um, cubic meters or cubic feet of concrete and build these enormous industrial scale reactors. I mean, that kind of stuff, as opposed to, oh, slow neutrons will trigger, uh, have a higher reaction rate. And so three kind of close variations of that, you can kind of cluster from this very wide number, dozens and dozens and dozens of widely circulating op-eds and opinion pieces and policy um, proposals and so on. They say, well, yeah, there, there are atomic secrets. There are things that legitimately should still be kept secret. Um, but they have nothing to do with kind of text-based information. It was things like, how do you deal with the fact that uranium hexafluoride will burn through existing industrial gaskets, when we talk about those gaseous diffusion uh, uh, tanks at Oak Ridge? Or how do you scale up a reactor from a kind of research reactor, like Enrico Fermi's first, very first uh, uh, pile that he helped oversee, the whole Chicago team? How do you go from that to bringing in DuPont contractors to scale up these unbelievably large, largest in the world at the time, uh, reactors and related power plants? Those kinds of things were secret. These folks argued they should remain secret, and they were uh, kind of not in danger of being quickly replicated because they depended on a huge material um, kind of uh, um, basis. Okay, now one of the things that, that starts to happen in the midst of these discussions was not only debate in the US about the, uh, the proper handling of these things moving forward, military or civilian oversight of a new agency and so on, but also that, that some secrets might indeed have already been shared or something, something that illicit might have actually slipped beyond the uh, carefully controlled perimeters of the wartime Manhattan Project. And this was really shocking, a series of these kind of revelations, some of which became very sensational. The, one of the very first happened three days after the official end of the Second World War. 
Uh, so in or the first week of September 1945, uh, this became more broadly known a few months later, but, but widening circles of people knew about this as early as the first week of September, it became kind of international news by February of 46, so not too long later. So what happened was there was an employee of the Soviet embassy in Canada named uh, Igor Guzenko, and he and his family defected. They were about to be restationed back to the Soviet Union. They didn't want to leave. Uh, and so Guzenko defected. He said basically he wanted to stay in Canada, uh, he and his family. And uh, to help, you know, kind of um, uh, make his case, he, he left with troves of documents from the Soviet embassy. He had been a cipher clerk. He worked in um, encryption, basically. Uh, for, for the Soviets as a Soviet uh, agent during the war stationed in Canada. And he took with him out of his office, like, you know, file cases full of, of secret documents that indicated wartime Soviet espionage vis-a-vis -vis both UK and Canadian projects. This was, as you can probably imagine, a big, big, big surprise uh, when this news finally broke broadly a few months later. So here he is, this is actually Guzenko under a hood. This was like a, it was like constant nightly news. Uh, he would, he was in public, but always shielded, his, his face was shielded. And in fact, the family went into something like witness um, protection. So the Canadian government eventually relented and he and his family were able to stay in, in Canada and they were given new identities, uh, much like, you know, a kind of witness, witness protection kind of program within the United States. So he would go on TV, but be hooded. It was very, again, you can imagine the kind of sensationalism of this. And he was a kind of fixture throughout 1946. So it turns out these materials had covered many forms of attempted and sometimes successful espionage, but it included as a little minor part of all the things he, he took with him, uh, sort of, kind of clues that led to a trail that ultimately led investigators to a British physicist named Alan Nunmay. He'd been trained at Cambridge, who had spent most of the war years working as part of the Manhattan Project in Canada at what was called the Chalk River nuclear reactor site. There were many, many reactors uh, built in many Manhattan Project installations, the biggest of which were at Hanford. There were other kind of experimental designs being worked on, including at this site uh, near Ottawa under the auspices of the Manhattan Project. So the British delegation had dozens and dozens, probably hundreds of uh, physicists and engineers who spent the war years at various Manhattan Project sites. Uh, Nunn May was one of them working at the reactor. Uh, he had been previously uh, a member of the Communist Party in Britain. He had a kind of sympathy toward the Soviet Union by his own later admissions. Uh, and he was very concerned that, our, that the, um, the Allies wartime ally, meaning the Soviet Union, which was fighting on the same side by that point as Britain, Canada, and the United States, was somehow not part of this otherwise information sharing program for the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project was explicitly a three nation cooperation, US, UK, and Canada, even though in a broader wartime context, so reasoned May at least, the Soviets were our allies as well, our meaning the allied side. And yet there was not the same kind of extension of cooperation or sharing. So he took it upon himself as became clear from, from investigators following these leaked documents from Guzenko and ultimately Alan Nunn may just uh, confess to it when confronted, that he had passed along physical samples from the reactor site to a Soviet agent that ultimately with the intention of getting him to aid the Soviet project. So uh, Nunn may was, was giving literally physical samples of radioactive materials, in this case, both U-233 and Enriched 235. Uh, and this was, um, in his mind, this would help speed their program. They could see the levels of purity or purification or enrichment that would be needed and so on. This was, uh, as he knew, clearly against the rules. And yet he, he convinced himself this was somehow okay because of um, the fact that the Soviet Union was uh, officially an ally of these other countries. So that, that was the first kind of atomic espionage revelation. It came from this very sensational uh, defection from the, from the Soviet clerk. And again, what, what was being traded, what was being moved around were physical samples of material. Here's um, a, a uranium, uh, an enriched uranium sample, small trace amount uh, that you know, nuclear chemists back in the Soviet Union might be able to, to, to make progress on. It was not about kind of um, paperwork. <clears throat> that characterization, however, began to change starting in September of 1948. 
So you have dozens and dozens of these articulations, what is the atomic secret until this time? And they, and they really follow this pattern of being about material industrial things, not about texts or formulas. And there's this very, I think, quite sharp break in the characterization of the so-called atomic secret, starting with, with, uh, with this report in September 1948. This was a, a, a very attention-grabbing report by a US congressional committee, the so-called House Committee on Un-American Activities. Uh, it was often abbreviated as HUAC for House Un-American Activities Committee, HUAC. Uh, this was a group, a stand, at the time, a standing committee, a permanent committee. It's not, it wasn't actually permanent, but it was, a, it was a, a, <clears throat> at the time, a, a, what's called a standing committee. It had been set, set up in the 1930s, but as many of you might know, became very active in the U.S. At, soon after the Second World War uh, and, and really led the charge in a kind of uh, anti-communist um, uh, series of investigations and, and, um, and efforts. So <clears throat> the, one of the first things they did after the war to get a lot of attention was, was hold some very high profile hearings about supposed or alleged communist infiltration of Hollywood and of the broader kind of educational industry, and I, not as entertainment industry. And the allegation was that all these um, left-leaning communists were gonna poison the minds of honest Americans uh, by, by, by seeping propaganda into movies that, consumer, that people would watch without realizing they're being kind of brainwashed. That, that was the level of the kind of discourse at the time. Their next big set of, of kind of headline grabbing revelations was actually about so-called atomic secrets, about allegations of nuclear espionage. And the way they chose to characterize it over and over and over again, which is a relentless, relentless similarity, was actually about text. It was about secret formulas or, um, or single pieces of paper that could be smuggled out as if it were kind of a James Bond movie and somehow aid a rival nation. By this point, they were mostly concerned about the Soviets. Uh, in somehow producing a, a weapon like from text alone. And that was quite a different framework than all these emphases on industrial capacity and material. So they first start, they, they, their, their first foray into the, into the atomic secrets kind of um, uh, landscape was this kind of blockbuster report that they released with great fanfare in September, 1948, where among the many, many claims they make was that there had been a so-called scientist X and they made sure they knew who it was, but they weren't gonna, weren't gonna release the name. It even heightened this kind of, uh, um, you know, the, the mystery of it all. The scientist X during the war, an employee of the Manhattan Project had given what they called a complicated formula to a known communist agent in spring of 43 with the express goal of helping the Soviets make their own uh, nuclear weapon. So here's an excerpt from, from their report. It's a very lengthy report, but here's where they describe a part of this episode in particular. They say, scientist X read to this alleged communist agent, who's actually a, a well-known labor organizer in the San Francisco Bay area, who might indeed have been a communist agent. I don't know. What he was known at the time was being a, a pro-labor activist. At the time, those were often conflated in, in public discourse. Anyway, what they wrote was that scientist X read to this other person a complicated formula, which this other person copied down, like you know, F equals MA, and oh, let me scribble that down. Scientist X gave his reason for asking the agent to copy it down, that the formula was in the handwriting of some other person, and that he, scientist X, had to return the formula to the University of California Radiation Laboratories in the morning. And as I write in the article, this is like medieval. It's like literally the handwriting of the scribe uh, is, sort of is infused with nuclear power. And that that one equation is enough to lead to proliferation of weapons. And therefore it has to be carefully ferreted back to the lab before anyone notices that one scrap of paper missing. If, if all it takes to, to produce a weapon is a stolen scrap of paper as opposed to a billion pounds or a billion cubic feet of concrete, then it sounds like a very scary issue indeed, doesn't it? What's interesting to go is to go back to the much later declassified uh, military intelligence, Divi intelligence division report on which HUAC was, was basing this allegation. Military Intelligence Division was a, was a version of a kind of domestic FBI attached uh, to the War Department during the war that was conducting all kinds of surveillance during the war, including of the Manhattan Project sites. So this was originally classified, many, many years later it was declassified. This is this, the portion of the transcript that seems to match closest to what HUAC was claiming. And, uh, if you, and, and I wanna be clear, it's not, to the, the case that this transcript was the, the, the um, 
the simple or, or complete truth either. I'm just saying, what was the documentary base on which these later claims were made for five years later? If you go back to the 1943 intelligence reports, they describe a very different scene. This alleged communist agent, the local uh, labor activist, had asked the scientist for copies of an article that had already been published. In fact, it goes on to say a, a, a research article published in the physical review, which is by definition not classified, let alone some scrap of paper and handwriting. And, and they, they, the intelligence agents had recorded this, um, this perhaps verbatim dialogue, which shows up in quotations in the report, is the scientist responding, quote, I could certainly get reprints of it. I could get you a copy of the article, um, but this would uh, give the Soviets no knowledge at all that would be helpful for making bombs. After all, uh, the details of nuclear fission had been published in the open literature. The synthesis of plutonium at University of California had been published in the open literature. And at least as the, as the once classified intelligence uh, report suggests, what was being traded was paper-based, not some handwritten formula and something that the scientist himself said would be of no particular value. It wouldn't tell them anything they didn't already know. But that's certainly not how this, how HUAC spun this because remember the transcript from the intelligence division was still highly classified. So HUAC could, could basically you know, try to control the message. And so they held these very public hearings under the, the Klieg lights, these very fam you know, famous lights. Uh, it was <clears throat> really all the rage. And they began what other observers at the time called a trial by newspaper. This was not a criminal proceeding, so there was no rules of evidence or cross-examination. This was a kind of public, um, not even a hearing, a public um, <clears throat> testimony, let's say, not subject to kind of legally binding protections for anyone uh, involved. And, and, and yet he, the, the committee could then kind of selectively and strategically leak information, which they proceeded to do for months and months. So they released their own big report and then would kind of surreptitiously or not so subtly uh, leak additional information to various uh, trusted newspaper reporters and keep this in the headlines. Uh, and, and likewise, not just uh, newspapers, but very broad circulation magazines as well. And I want to remind ourselves, uh, I, it took me a while to piece this together at first. Why would they do this in September 48 if the, if the intelligence di division had already vetted this uh, in 1943? And I realized, oh, September 1948 was right before a big and highly, highly contested presidential election in the United States, the, the election in early November of 48. And this was <clears throat> one way to try to kind of score political points um, as happens before and since, as we were quite familiar with, uh, of one party trying to convince the voters the other party shouldn't be trusted with, with sensitive matters, including things like um, uh, nuclear energy. So this was at least in part a kind of political um, <clears throat> opportunity, which I don't want to suggest was unusual. That's, as we know, that happens before and since, but the it helps us make sense of the timing of it. This was as much about presidential election politics as it was any kind of new revelation about espionage. And what interested me was actually the shift in how HUAC chose to, to characterize uh, the most dangerous or seemingly the most important um, elements of what it takes to make nuclear weapons. It goes from industrial capacity to a single slip of paper that could be very carefully smuggled out of the country. <clears throat> And then following that report in a very kind of, again, a sensationalistic report uh, released er, in September of 1948, then you see just, again, a huge proliferation of kind of news media, congressional testimony, um, uh, public lectures and all the rest, uh, all addressing the question, what is the atomic secret? But now all clustering around this kind of text, not material or industrial capacity. So again, people might disagree on what the atomic secret is, but there's a new clustering. It's no longer about uh, hard stuff to ship overseas, but about simple stuff, like things you can write down on a piece of paper. And here's an example uh, that I, I find very haunting or telling. When Albert Einstein was featured sort of yet again on the cover of either Time Magazine or Life Magazine, I can't remember which, they put uh, his famous equation in the mushroom cloud uh, as if, the, as if the bombs were made from that equation, as if that equation had had any particular role in designing, let alone, let alone developing, testing, and using uh, these, these new kind of technical devices. And so the, when people said there is an atomic secret, they would give the answer to say it's either these so-called complicated formulas, 
or it's things like information about the nuclear stockpile. The US has this many weapons ready versus that many that could be smuggled out, you know, on a piece of paper. The size and shape of the bomb, that would have implications for things like delivery systems, what kind of airplane or boat might you need. A blueprint or some kind of sketch about that very complicated implosion mechanisms we talked a bit about, that that was the secret and you could have a single diagram that would somehow give it all away or other kind of so-called general principles of bomb design. So again, there's lots and lots of, of kind of, there's a, there's a kind of variance in what people think the atomic secret is, but, the, but they're clustering now in a very different characterization of both how science and technology works and of what's sort of most careful to kind of guard. And I found that shift really very, very interesting. And once again, this is not playing out in a vacuum. Not only was there the US sort of election season to think about, but even uh, about a year later, uh, more dramatic developments that again, just kept this theme in the news for, for really for years. So again, as some of you might know, late in August of 1949, so um, four years after the end of the Second World War, the Soviet Union did su succeed in secretly detonating its own first nuclear weapon. It was a fission bomb. Uh, plutonium weapon using uh, an implosion mechanism remarkably similar to that, that which was tested at the Trinity test and then ultimately used in the bomb uh, over Nagasaki. So it's a very similar kind of device that the Soviets detonated in secret uh, in, in their own territory in August of 49. The US authorities nicknamed it Joe One, in, not really in honor, but it's sort of in reference, in joking reference to Joseph Stalin, who was still the leader uh, of the Soviet Union. Then about three to three and a half weeks later, US President Harry Truman announced to great dramatic fanfare that the US had detected the Soviet test. The Soviets did not announce it. In fact, they kept it secret. The Soviets had been announcing all along until then that they had detected weapons that turned out to have been intentional propaganda and misinformation. And when they actually did successfully detonate a bomb, they didn't announce it. Three weeks later, the US president announced it instead. And what I find super interesting is actually another really interesting book by my friend, Michael Gordon, who, whose work I mentioned previously. Michael wrote this book called Red Cloud at Dawn. And he does, a, I think, a really fascinating reconstruction of the decision-making process within the US government about whether and how to announce that the US teams had detected the Soviet bomb. In brief, the worry was that if the US announced that the US government knew the Soviets had detonated the bomb, would that give away too much of our own kind of espionage and surveillance uh, infrastructure? It turns out the, the, the US gained confidence about this detonation with these kind of high altitude aircraft that were already in, or at least very close to Soviet airspace. That was already, would have been seen as problematic or maybe provocative. And these planes were equipped with certain kinds of uh, detectors to, to find trace amounts of certain radioactive materials. And a few days after uh, the actual detonation, uh, these planes found uh, compelling evidence for certain rare isotopes that seem to be only associated with that kind of implosion weapon. So the question was, do you even say anything? Because then will the Soviets know that we have these planes in or near their airspace? We, I just find that fascinating. So not only, you know, yes, we know, but we can't tell you how we know. It's one of these, you know, uh, again, quintessential kind of Cold War uh, episodes. You can read more about that in, in Michael's book. Anyway, the point is true. The, the balance, the decision was indeed to announce it, but with no official announcement of how the US knew. But now this became again, really shocking uh, in many parts of the world, including in the US. The, US, the so-called US monopoly over nuclear weapons had been shattered. Now, the country that had emerged as the greatest uh, kind of political rival in the post-war scene, meaning the Soviet Union, had its own weapons of mass destruction. And what's interesting is that until that time, US authorities kept saying that the Soviets are still five years away. The very first assessments right after the end of the war were that the Soviet Union would need at least five years to make their own weapon. That was, turns out to have been actually pretty close. The challenge was that every year or you know, continuously, US authorities would keep making these updated estimates and they keep saying the Soviets are still five years away. That became therefore less and less accurate as you can imagine. So the first estimates were pretty reasonable. In 1948, it was no longer reasonable to say the Soviets will need until 1953 to make their own bomb. So, so when Joe, so-called Joe One, when this first Soviet weapon was detected and, uh, and successfully detonated, that really seemed like a big, big shock, even to the insiders in the US who, so to speak, should have known better. And so this just, again, kind of ramps up the, the kind of um, Cold War 
um, jockeying. Uh, and, and therefore the discussions about things like, is there an atomic secret and what should we do about it? Now, soon on the heels of that, again, very sort of surprising information from, from many people in the United States. Soon after that, uh, starting in late January, 1950, uh, other news broke that there had been at least, an, at least one more uh, sort of um, you know, example of, of atomic espionage from the Manhattan Project during the war. This also involved a, a member of the British delegation who like Alan Nunn May had been sent over to North America as part of the British team to work uh, on various Manhattan Project sites. In this case, it was this individual Klaus Fuchs. Here's his badge photo from Los Alamos. Um, so Fuchs uh, had, was actually originally from Germany. He was uh, very early anti-Nazi. Uh, and I, we were talking about this a little, a little bit during uh, office hours earlier today. There was a phrase that came into common usage in the United States after the war uh, called prematurely anti-fascist. That was code for someone who's probably a communist because in the earliest days in Germany, the groups that were most actively trying to oppose the Nazis even before the Nazis took over were the communists. There was a kind of left-right kind of battle. And so if you were against the Nazis before you had quote unquote legitimate reasons to be against the Nazis, then it meant you were a communist. At least it, it seemed to imply that really remarkable kind of, there, were, there was no, no room for anything in between. So Fuchs was one of these left-leaning, perhaps indeed communist um, uh, members who had been pre prematurely anti-fascist. When the Nazis took over, he then had to get out of Germany fast. So he emigrated to Britain as so many young physicists and mathematicians did. He then got involved with the British uh, uranium projects and then was sent over uh, to, to North America. He first worked at Oak, Oak Ridge for quite some time in detail and things like isotope separation, and then was relocated to Los Alamos and worked on many aspects, uh, or at least a few aspects of the project from there. Uh, and then he went back to Britain after the war and worked on the British nuclear um, efforts at Harwell near, um, sort of not so far from Oxford. And then again, one of these kind of um, intelligence investigations finally led to, to suspicion, suspicion about Fuchs. He confessed, uh, late in January 1950, that he had indeed been sharing materials with a Soviet agent throughout the war. That confession then led to other uh, investigations, many of them still now back in the United States, and that led to the arrest of people, including uh, very famously Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, uh, a husband and wife uh, pair, who were uh, based in New York City. They weren't at Los Alamos, but Ethel Rosenberg's brother, David Greenglass had been stationed at Los Alamos as an army machinist. He was not a trained scientist, but he was one of the many, many, many technicians who was on site at Los Alamos. He, like uh, his sister, had a, at the very least left-leaning political sympathies. And during the war, it, perhaps with Fuchs's help, or in any case, the investigation of Fuchs led to this other ring, Greenglass had been kind of smuggling out some things or trying to get information from Los Alamos to, with the intention of getting it to the Soviets, and it seems that, uh, that his brother-in-law, Julius Rosenberg, helped uh, in ferreting this information out. So when this came to light, there was a very, again, hugely sensational trial uh, in the United States for the Rosenbergs. Greenglass agreed to testify against his family. So he was given basically kind of immunity, cut a deal. So even though Greenglass was the one who, who actually stole the materials, he cooperated with the prosecution uh, and the trial turned out to be against Julius and Ethel Rosenberg and a, and a third um, a defendant, uh, Morton Sobel. Uh, and so here's an example of what was uh, uh, entered into evidence for the prosecution of David Greenglass, as, if I remember correctly, um, redrawing from memory the kinds of sketches he had acquired during the war and had, and had tried to get to the Soviets. And this was uh, a kind of fairly crude sketch of, uh, of the implosion mechanism uh, for a plutonium bomb. So again, what's fascinating, the trial stretches out over 1951, again, so like daily updates in the newspapers and, and nightly news. Uh, and to aid the prosecution, the Atomic Energy Commission, which was this kind of post-war successor to the Manhattan Project, they actually declassified what was then being called the single most closely guarded atomic secret, which was this implosion mechanism. So to gain, to help the prosecution gain a conviction of the Rosenbergs for espionage, the, the government agency literally declassified what they were at the same time claiming was the single atomic secret that presumably could be written down on a single piece of paper and smuggled out to another place. 
In fact, at one point I write about this in the paper, uh, when testimony about this was being given by Greenglass under oath, they partially emptied the courtroom gallery of everyone except journalists. So if you wanna keep something secret, I would think you would get the journalists out and let the jury stay uh, and, and let the other uh, civilian onlookers stay. They did the opposite. So really just kind of mixed messages about what is or is not the most uh, you know, potential or, or serious atomic secret. The point is this is all about text-based sort of diagrams or formulas and not about the industrial capacity. And again, as you, as you may know, the Rosenbergs were found guilty. They were ultimately executed soon thereafter. Uh, and there's lots and lots and lots that's been written about that. Many, many things were once classified and in, in, over, over the decades have, uh, have become declassified. It seems, I, there's more to be said, but it seems that Julius Rosenberg very likely was guilty of at least some of the things he was accused of. It's much less clear that Ethel Rosenberg was, was guilty of the things for which he was convicted. And there's all this stuff that, that, that was later found out of kind of prosecutorial strategies to go after Ethel Rosenberg hard in the hopes that Julius would confess and that they both had neither confessed. So uh, anyway, a, a really messy, messy trial. Also, it looked like some uh, not proper um, coordination between the prosecution and the judge. It was, it, was a, it was a mess in terms of just legal procedure. And I think on, no matter what side one comes down historically about the efficacy of, of nuclear espionage, I don't think anyone claims this was a, a clear or clean uh, trial. Thousands of pages written about it, but that's just the upshot. The point is it's, it's coming on, on the heels of these quite dramatic revelations about wartime espionage. So once this was, was or at least parts of this was becoming uh, part of the public record, many commentators, especially in the United States at the time, and even since then, have kind of reached toward this, these examples of espionage, Alan Nunn May, the, the, the Green Glass Rosenberg's connection, Klaus Fuchs, and then others that have since come to light, a handful of others, to say, well, that must explain why and how the Soviets actually did succeed in making a nuclear weapon so soon uh, compared to estimates. Remember, it wasn't so soon compared to the original estimates, so soon compared to the later estimates, which proved to have been inaccurate. And so the idea was, in a sense, that they cheated, right? That they only caught up with the uh, Allied effort uh, because they uh, had all the benefits of espionage. Once again, I want to uh, give a shout out to my friend uh, and colleague, Alex Wellerstein, who has a fantastic uh, set of online materials at his blog. It's a blog with footnotes. This is actually like a scholarly blog. Uh, and he has a great piece from actually from a number, number of years ago by now uh, about hand-drawn diagrams from one of the heads of the Soviet nuclear weapons project, Igor Kachatov, to the equivalent of the kind of Leslie Groves figure, uh, Lavrenti Beria, from early 1946, which you can see this sort of handwritten Cyrillic that looked like pretty compelling versions of an implosion design. The implication being that Kurchatov really was benefiting from some of these kind of purloined um, uh, uh, worksheets and, and, and figures that people like Green Glass and Fuchs were able to supply. On the other hand, since the fall of the Soviet Union, many more uh, materials from, from Soviet sources have become available to scholars within uh, Russia uh, and, and elsewhere. And the story, again, like most stories, gets a bit more complicated. And here, um, some really interesting, uh, more recent analyses by Alexei Kozhevnikov. We've read some of his work for the paper two assignment. Uh, and, and also, again, Michael Gordon's book that I mentioned. That espionage, I think it's fair to say, clearly played some role in the Soviet program, but it's not so straightforward what the efficacy was, or I say what the role was. With, uh, and there's lots, it, again, it, the more one looks, the more complicated the story gets rather than simple, which is maybe, maybe that's how it often is in history. So here are some of the salient points. There's much more that, that these other folks go into that I find really interesting. The information that was obtained via espionage, and some of it clearly was obtained by espionage, to within the Soviet Union was often treated as suspect because uh, at least some of the folks there didn't know if they were being fed intentional misinformation. Was this a kind of information war after all? And so were, were these things being planted so that Soviet agents might be duped into getting kind of unhelpful information? And so often these would be doled out uh, to various kind of internally rivalry groups within this very large Soviet program. It grew to be you know, very, very big, much like the Manhattan Project. And so you'd have competing groups that would almost have a kind of peer review, for lack of a better term. One group would be told, this is from the American Project and we think it's real, go with it. 
Another group would be told, basically, we think this is garbage, poke holes in it. And so it's not like they said, here's the answer, go do it. Um, likewise, uh, again, as became clear only decades later, the Soviets wound up pursuing many, many routes in parallel, much as the US uh, or the Allied project had done during the war, even with the knowledge of the, of the efforts that had proven to be most effective in, this, in the US case. So typically for the US project, if there were four different ideas to, with, to separate a fissionable uranium from the uh, more stable isotope, the response from General Groves was usually try all four. If there's a war on, give it all you got, try all of them, we'll go with whatever's quickest. And yet, and, and afterwards, some would prove to have been more effective than others. It seems clear that the Soviets often did the same thing, even knowing which wound up being the most effective version uh, in, in the wartime Manhattan Project, the Soviets would often set up parallel efforts uh, instead of only trying the one that it seemed most effective. So not, that's not a huge savings of time or effort either. And also even more tricky that a lot of these uh, very, very complicated uh, devices, you know, these bombs like the implosion design, depended on very specific properties of non-nuclear materials, both epoxies, kinds of glues or adhesives, certain kinds of uh, literally the wiring to try to make sure that you have um, sub microsecond accuracy for the firing circuits, but also these different kinds of conventional explosives that burn at different rates. So you're trying to make this shaped uh, ingoing um, pressure wave. And, they, and the Soviets had different forms of kind of like TNT equivalent. So they weren't just copying, they couldn't just copy the blueprints even if they had rather complete blueprints. So it's not to say the espionage was irrelevant. I'd hardly think that's the case, but it also seems pretty inaccurate uh, to say the Soviet bomb was sort of merely a product of copying the Manhattan Project. And so again, we get these, the, the kind of real life experience of these complicated human endeavors uh, didn't fit into the neat stories that were being told uh, then or since. So in the meantime, again, coming back to things that really caught my attention about the way espionage and so-called atomic secrets were being characterized uh, throughout the US at this time, was after the news about Klaus Fuchs did become very broadly known, it was major newspaper news by uh, late January 1950, there was a kind of slippage that became very common. I find this actually very chilling. A slippage not to say all German communists who came to the United States were actually um, bad. That might have been one conclusion people might have unfairly drawn, but that, that wasn't where people went. The conclusion reached often was that all theoretical physicists are suspect. Let me let that sink in for a second. That because of Klaus Fuchs, because of, of his uh, perfidy, uh, and because of his, what was often called his warped mentality, his sort of uh, infantile, naive sense of how the world should work that, as characterized by, by his critics, uh, that that's a, a sign of physicists who have been too poorly trained in the humanities. That part I like. That's why we have GIRs here in Hask courses, right? The, the, the allegation was these narrow-minded scientists hadn't learned about government and history and literature and human affairs. So they have like baby ideas about how the world works, including kind of idealized notions of world government or of communist um, utopias. And so therefore theoretical physicists as a group are dangerous. If you think the bomb was made by equations, if you think the bomb is essentially, you know, text made real, and therefore the most dangerous things are formulas and engineering diagrams as opposed to billion cubic feet of concrete, if, if theories are dangerous because they make bombs, and if theorists have this kind of warped or unbalanced education where they're more susceptible to so-called communist propaganda than well-trained economists or whatever else, uh, then that's a double danger, right? Because the bombs are made, uh, allegedly made by theorists using kind of reifying equations. I find that just stunning that people would have come to those conclusions knowing that the Manhattan Project acquired, you know, unprecedented industrial capacity with experts from metallurgy and chemical engineering and electric engineering and many, many areas well beyond uh, theoretical physics. And so you have this really strange way of, of thinking about scientific and technical progress, let alone thinking about individuals who, who kind of major in one field of study or another. And again, that doesn't die down very quickly. As late as 1956, there's a case of a federal judge sentencing a Cornell grad student to jail time. The grad student had been accused of being a, a member of the Communist Party. The student pled the Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination in court. That was not at the time recognized as a legitimate defense. That was kind of righted uh, a few years later with the Warren court. 
So he was held in contempt and sent to jail, not only for not cooperating, but because the federal judge was convinced that younger generation of pure scientists engaged in research in physics, by which he meant this Cornell theoretical physics grad student, has succumbed to communistic propaganda. Again, that's a remarkable leap or slippage between uh, sort of bombs or formulas and theorists or commies. <laughs> that, that seems to go well beyond the, the, the evidence at the time about uh, some instances of espionage that, that, that indeed were serious, but might have had um, a, a range of possible outcomes. Let me pause. Oh, oh, the last part, the last slide before we pause. This again starts to have real world implications of many kinds. One that again, I found rather, rather surprising. Is if you go back and look at, at in the congressional record, it's now thankfully digitized, go up and count all of the hearings in the first decade after the end of the Second World War that this House Un-American Activities Committee held that involved any academics. They held all kinds of hearings about labor organizers, about school teachers, about Hollywood scriptwriters, but they held lots and lots of hearings about academics, again, with this fear about kind of poisoning impressionable youth. And you count up by anything you want to count, the number of witnesses who were subpoenaed to testify, to pardon me, testify the number of hearings on specific topics, or the number of days devoted to those hearings by any measure, you see that they were overwhelmingly drawing on theoretical physicists in particular, more, much more than say chemists, much more than economists or philosophers or political scientists who actually once studied things like communist world systems or uh, you know, um, demand side economics or anything else. So the people who, were, who HUAC deemed most dangerous and most in need of these kind of interrogation, high profile congressional hearings, were people who by then they could associate with nuclear secrets, which were formulas, which were dangerous. Uh, and so this begins having a long tail and there were just dozens and dozens of careers that were really destroyed because people uh, chose to plead the Fifth Amendment or the First Amendment or um, you know, uh, had been briefly members of a communist party for a study group in 1935 and found it boring and left and suddenly that came back to haunt them and were fired from tenured as well as tenure track positions and all the rest. A, lot, a very strong amount of blacklisting that went on that again, many scholars have, have since begun to document. But you see, I, I can only make sense of charts like this what, by thinking about you know, what were the depictions of how science and technology work, let alone uh, what, what's the uh, most important part behind making nuclear weapons. So let me pause there, there's a lot to, to chew on. The next parts will be, will be quicker. Hmm. So Gary asks, uh, was Nixon uh, in the house? Uh, yeah, so Nixon, so part of the, so, uh, the famous HUAC hearings did involve a very young member of Congress, Richard Nixon, uh, before even his first run for president, let alone his later ones. Uh, and so this was, you know, it was a bipartisan committee. It was a standing committee of the house, but then as now the majority party could appoint uh, you know, the chair people and so on. So during this particular period, uh, it was chaired by uh, some Republicans who, who clearly were out against the Democrat, uh, Harry Truman for re-election. It was, again, that's not, that's neither surprising nor illegal. We have a, a two party system in this country for better or worse. But the, but the, the way that the committee was, was um, activated uh, had a very, very clear and very, very impactful um, partisan slant. Uh, the Alger Hiss case was exactly part of the exact same uh, uh, period. Exactly right, Gary. Lucas says, we seem to know a lot about Soviet espionage during the Manhattan Project. What about German or Japanese? What about Very good. I don't know of any, and that's a fascinating question, Lucas. I can't think of a single instance. I'll turn to the TAs if any of them have come across it. Um, I don't know of any. That's really interesting. There have been a, a handful more, like three or four more instances of uh, of of wartime espionage, again, in aid of the Soviets or intended aid of the Soviets, often from US citizens um, during the war from the Manhattan Project that were, that were totally unknown at the time and came to light literally decades later, but still only a handful. And all the ones I know of were people um, with, the, with the intent of helping the Soviets, which again, as I remind uh, all of us, the Soviets were a wartime ally of the US, ally of, of, of the US, the UK and Canada, and I'm not saying that excuses it, but that was often highlighted as a motivation for many of these folks. I'm not endorsing that behavior, but they, they would say, they, many of them would say, the Soviets are, are uh, you know, uh, losing many more members of their army than we are on behalf of the Allied Front. These kinds of arguments would, for which I can understand where that was coming from at least. And I don't know of a single instance of, of even attempted, um, let alone successful espionage from the US projects uh, either for Germany and Japan. There was a lot more in the other direction. We talked briefly about 
US surveillance of the German nuclear project, including kidnapping nuclear scientists and all that. Uh, Johan asks, uh, was physics in allied occupied Germany, what was physics like in allied occupied Germany in Central Europe? Oh, very good question. That's a big topic. So the short answer is there was a lot of effort soon after the war under uh, something that became known as the Marshall Plan uh, to do a, a heavy investment by the United States in many parts of the world, including um, uh, Germany, to try to help them reinvest and reestablish a kind of civil society, um, partly, you know, uh, as a bulwark against kind of further uh, temptations, it would have been called at the time, to, to align with the Soviets. Partly, some revisionist historians have said to make more markets and, and, and uh, make it easier to trade for uh, American you know, commercial interests. I think that's true. I think sometimes it's overblown, but certainly was part of the calculation. And also for these kind of geostrategic uh, alliance efforts. Um, so there was a kind of strategic use of, of redevelopment or rebuilding aid generally. And as some of my colleagues like John Krieger and other historians have shown that a, a fair amount of support for basic research in the sciences in many countries of Europe were undertaken with a similar kind of um, aim by, by the US, including by private US-based foundations as well as US government dollars. Sometimes we now know those foundations were a cover for CIA money. It was basically money laundering to kind of buy influence or buy good, good relations with otherwise left-leaning scientists in France, for example or to avoid what looked like uh, too heavy an influence of communist thinking in certain uh, otherwise influential cultural figures, including lots of scientists. So there was often very, very generous, in terms of dollars that were spent, very generous funding on basic sciences and institutes, including Niels Bohr's Institute, but many in France, many in what would become Western Germany, many in Italy, um, many joint kind of summer schools and educational um, um, efforts uh, under NATO as well as just the US. And again, there was frankly a kind of mixture of incentives or, or kind of strategic thinking behind that on the US side, much of which came to light only, only decades later, including, as I say, like literal money laundering, as well as, let's say, more transparent funding uh, that nonetheless had a range of kind of motivations behind it. Um, so that, and anyway, that, so more to be said, but that's a fascinating question. Alex asks, is it possible the AEC declassified this so-called uh, most closely guarded secret? in order to draw attention away from industrial secrets. That's really interesting, Alex, maybe. Uh, certainly that would be consistent with their moves. But what I find interesting is that they, it really was, frankly, it was a kind of double speak. And again, my, my, um, <laughs> my ability to, to, to find a, a kind of um, benevolent explanation in this instance is strained, seeing just how, how much was going on um, behind the scenes improperly, and in some cases, I think actually illegally. Uh, with kind of a coordination between prosecution and the judge or between federal agencies and, um, and, and journalists. I, I, there was a lot of very intentional leaking of otherwise protected information for strategic purposes. And again, I don't mean to say that was brand new, that's been happening you know, as long as humans have kept secrets, but there was a lot of, I, I think, very kind of strategic kind of flows of um, let me, of, of basically of, of smear campaigns. I mean, that's really what I think what could be called. And even if the people being smeared had done terrible things that deserve punishment, and I think in many, many cases, that seems like a fair conclusion, the means by which it was done were often uh, at least as troublesome or as, as worthy of, of, of careful um, evaluation years later. So I don't know, I just, I find it's just, a, honestly, it's a cesspit. When you, when you start digging this stuff, it's, it doesn't inspire one for human nature. Very, few, I guess very few things in history do, but a lot of this gets super messy. And again, we can, I can sort of appreciate the, what people thought were the stakes. I mean, you know, nuclear weapons, now the Soviets have one, all these people were active in espionage. And you can see this kind of drumbeat of drama. So I don't mean to suggest that uh, cool heads would have, would have prevailed today. Uh, I don't think they would have. But nonetheless, with the fullness of time, with fuller documentation that was, of what was going on in many parts of the world, not only within the United States, I think we can reevaluate many of these maneuvers that were done uh, in this kind of high, high fever moment uh, and, and maybe try to learn from them moving forward, put it that way. Let me move on. Let me, let me go to these next parts. They'll be, they'll be quicker, but let's, let's press on to uh, next parts for today and talk about uh, this next section on the decision in the United States to pursue a new kind of nuclear weapon, the hydrogen bomb. And again, we saw some of this in, in the film Day After Trimming. 
So in October 1949, a few years into the nuclear age, the Atomic Energy Commission's General Advisory Committee was often called the GAC, which was a, a civilian advisory committee to the Civilian Atomic Energy Commission with many experts, um, uh, some of whom were, uh, were just sort of outside consultants, many of whom were Manhattan Project um, uh, veterans, but otherwise not full-time involved in the nuclear effort afterwards. This advisory committee of approximately a dozen people uh, wrote a, a top secret report recommending to the federal government not to pursue the development of this new kind of weapon, the hydrogen bomb. In fact, some committee members actually argued that such a weapon would be, in their words, an evil thing in any light. And we'll see more about what these weapons were in a few minutes, but they were saying that there were all kinds of reasons not to pursue them. And at least some of these members made uh, an explicitly moral or kind of ethical argument that these weapons are in the parlance of today, weapons of mass destruction that could only be used against civilians. These are no longer in any sense um, uh, weapons of a, for a military um, uh, theater. It, it, that was a, a top secret report, uh, though it again angered uh, certain powerful political figures who were very gung ho on uh, trying to develop things like uh, hydrogen weapons. And Oppenheimer began to stand out more and more in many of these people's minds as a kind of um, drag on the system that he was perhaps intentionally trying to sway his own colleagues on the General Advisory Committee. He chaired the, the General Advisory Committee at the time. Was he, was he uh, uh, exercising undue influence on them? Was he trying to lobby against uh, a new kind of weapon that many that some people thought you know, the nation needed in order um, to secure the peace and so on? So this played a very, very large role in the eventual uh, security hearing against Oppenheimer, uh, the result of which was that he was stripped of his security clearance uh, and, and no longer consulted for the federal government starting in 1954. So the H-bomb decision was fraught on many, many levels over many years. That's, that's the idea. It was associated, became closely associated with Oppenheimer because he chaired this GAC committee. The GAC committee report was highly classified. In fact, the text was only declassified and, and widely available starting in the 1980s, decades later. Now you can find it easily online in many, many places. And if you go back and read the actual report, uh, it, it does indeed argue against the development of a hydrogen weapon, but not because of uh, uh, ethical worries and not because the members of the GAC were striking a kind of um, you know, pacifist tone or an anti-nuclear tone by any means. In fact, the report is very, advocates a very aggressive nuclear stance and they argue against hydrogen weapons as we'll see in a few, for several reasons, because the committee worried that it would de derail too much of the critical, what they considered a critical effort to make more and more working weapons of the World War II type. That, they, that any effort ought to make as yet unproven uh, hydrogen bombs would actually be too disruptive to the arsenal of, to, for other kinds of nuclear weapons, which the group said were essential to, to, to go on full speed ahead. So not only was Oppenheimer not being some sort of you know, pacifist dove saying um, uh, all bombs are, are bad, uh, they were actually Oppenheimer's own committee and Oppenheimer's cover letter and so on makes it clear that he individually and the committee broadly were advocating an aggressive expansion of the nuclear weapons capabilities. And it was only this minority report included as an appendix written not by Oppenheimer, but by other um, uh, members, Enrico Fermi and Isidore Rabi, that also raises additional reason not to pursue a hydrogen bomb where they speak uh, briefly but in explicitly moral tones. That wasn't Oppenheimer at all, in fact, and it doesn't seem to be, have reflected his views at the time. And we know that because Oppenheimer was doing lots of consulting until his clearance was stripped. So even after the, the 1949 um, report from the General Advisory Committee, uh, he was doing all, leading all kinds of study groups for, for classified advice on nuclear issues. Another example of them, many, many, was conducted in the summer of 1951. Uh, it was held on Caltech's campus, but again, it was all classified work sponsored by the US Army and the Air Force called Project Vista and had many, many parts. But one of those had to do with um, uh, kind of nuclear strategies for different kinds of stances vis-a-vis -vis, um, the Soviet Union. And the, and the subcommittee that, that Oppenheimer actually chaired recommended that hundreds of nuclear weapons should be deployed throughout Western Europe, including, you know, like West Germany and, and uh, allied NATO bases all around uh, Western Europe with actual kind of working tactical weapons that would be, uh, could be used and should be used, they argued, to repel uh, uh, 
a, a, a potential invasion from the Soviet army. The, the worry at this point was that the Soviet army, in terms of numbers of troops, which is so much larger than any of the uh, NATO affiliated armies, that if it were conventional warfare fought in the early 50s, the Soviets would just roll over anyone else was the fear. So this group said, well, then we'll just use usable tactical nuclear weapons on the battlefield to repel an otherwise numerically superior Soviet invading force. So Oppenheimer's own committee uh, pushes for a first use nuclear policy, which was incredibly aggressive at the time, that not only should these weapons be deployed, but we should use them first, even if the other side doesn't use nukes first. By this point, the Soviets had their nuclear weapons. So this wasn't greeted with fanfare by everyone who could see it. In fact, it made more enemies with the Air Force because this seemed to cede more control over nuclear weapons to the Army than the Air Force. There's always this internal rivalry and tension. So the Air Force said, we should be the only ones who handle nuclear weapons because we have the big bombs and, we, and, and or the big planes and we, we, we can deliver them. So Oppenheimer made more internal enemies, but not because he was saying get rid of nuclear weapons, because he was saying make more of them and, use, and be ready to use them um, aggressively. I, I find that chilling. Meanwhile, what were some more of the arguments within the actual 1949 GAC report? Why else did they say not to pursue a hydrogen weapon uh, and instead to, to focus on um, implosion fission weapons? Two and a half years, or I guess one and a half years after the end of the war, in April of 47, the US still only had components for seven bombs. They weren't even assembled. If there had been you know, a sudden change uh, in, in the geopolitical um, uh, situation and there was deemed to be some need uh, to start using bombs as they've been used uh, at the end of the Second World War, there were only parts uh, for seven bombs, even uh, nearly two years later after the end of the war. Two years after that, or two and a half years after that, the entire stockpile was still only 235 weapons. Of course, that was a closely guarded secret at the time. That's one of these things that has since been declassified. So that was very, very much on the minds of members of the GAC who had security clearance to know all these things. They argue saying we should be concentrating on building up a stockpile of weapons we know how to make and then we know uh, could be effective, militarily effective in their, in their estimation. Likewise, they go on to say the delivery systems, which by that point mostly meant aircraft, would limit the size of hydrogen bombs. The idea was that uh, any design that might work, and there were at that point no workable designs, all the ideas seem to require enormous sort of factory scale associated equipment like cryogenics and so on. You'd have to ship like a small factory, part of which would then blow up was at least the, the, the thought. How could you possibly get these things to um, a kind of uh, military target? They're gonna be too large even for the biggest bombers in the aircraft in the Air Force's fleet. So we can't, we don't know how to make them, they're saying. And if we could make them, they wouldn't be practical for delivery. Remember, this is long before rockets. This is long before Sputnik and so on. So as they write in their own report, their classified report, there appears to be no chance of hydrogen weapons being an economical alternative to fission weapons based on what they call the strict criteria of damage area per dollar. If we wanna have a kind of nuclear arsenal, they're arguing, uh, let's make it of weapons we know how to make and that we know uh, could be delivered. There are even more kind of esoteric challenges that the group was, was wrestling with, again, in, in the report, in the classified report, as well as uh, other, uh, uh, other uh, uh, you know, classified briefings. So at the time that the GAC wrote this report, all the known kind of projected hydrogen bomb designs, none of which have been tested or built yet, all of the kind of uh, uh, pro prototype uh, ideas required huge amounts of tritium. That's a, a heavy isotope of hydrogen. Not, they're called hydrogen bombs, but ordinary hydrogen, it was feared, wouldn't be enough. You needed many more neutrons per, um, per hydrogen nucleus. You need a heavy isotope called tritium. Tritium then as now was very rare and very expensive to produce. It, the naturally occurring amounts are trace. So again, much like plutonium, the idea is you'd have to make tritium in reactors and the designs called for kilograms worth of tritium per bomb, just like they called for tens of kilograms worth of plutonium, producing just 10 grams, not even, not even a whole kilogram, producing 10 grams of tritium at the time meant taking reactors offline that otherwise would have been producing plutonium for the, for the kind of known design of nuclear weapons. And so they go through this calculation, the US would forego 100 or more fission bombs per hydrogen bomb, even if the designs would work, because the materials that would be needed uh, were, were so rare. And it was a direct trade-off, a zero-sum game, they argue, in how you produce uh, 
the fissionable materials versus the, the fusion fuel. So they make this report saying for all these tactical and strategic reasons, we, we advise against a crash course development of a hydrogen bomb that was delivered to uh, uh, many US officials, including the president. Nonetheless, really just weeks later, on the very last day of January, 1950, uh, the US president, Harry Truman announced publicly that he was nonetheless ordering the crash course development of a hydrogen bomb. That was a public announcement. And at the same time, then ordered a gag order so anyone with information about this could no longer speak to the press. So he makes a public announcement then limits other public discussion. And again, looking back and say, oh, but what about all this smart input from the GAC? They had clearance, they seemed, they were experienced, they made good arguments. Again, I can, with hindsight, I can sort of see how Truman may, might've felt like his hand was forced, not only because of idea, arguments about tritium rates of production, but also because of what else was changing in the world around him, around, around many people. Remember, only weeks before, he had announced to the world that the Soviets now had their own nuclear weapon, that announcement about so-called Joe One. One week after that, the, the communists in China won militarily. They beat the nationalists. The, China had had a, a, an ongoing civil war. The US had backed one side, the other side won, the explicit Chinese Communist Party. So now it looked like uh, many people read that as a kind of domino effect of, of further um, communist expansion, first the Soviets, now the Chinese. That was at least how it was often read or interpreted in the US. And then just days before Truman's announcement, uh, Klaus Fuchs confessed to Espinar saying, yes, I really was stealing stuff from wartime Manhattan product to give to the Soviets. So in some sense, we can, we, can make, we can understand how Truman might have arrived at that decision, even though there were, uh, one might say, um, uh, at least understandable, and I think maybe compelling reasons given on the other side. Remember, this is all before there was a single notion of how to actually make a hydrogen bomb. Truman was saying, we'll work harder at it, basically. So more than a year after his announcement, in March of 1951, under high secrecy, there was a first kind of really important conceptual breakthrough we now know. It wasn't known widely at the time. And that was introduced by these two uh, individuals, uh, Stan Ulam, who was interviewed in, in the day after Trinity. He's a mathematician who worked at wartime Los Alamos and stayed most, much of his time at Los Alamos. And this, uh, and the theoretical physicist Edward Teller. Uh, and the two of them were working together and kind of bouncing ideas back and forth. Uh, and together around the same time, they helped refine this idea in secret that's now called the uh, either Teller Ulam or Ulam Teller idea. There's a, there's a real fight afterwards about who deserves more credit. So Ulam Teller, Ulam does seem to have gotten to the main idea first, even Teller seemed to grudgingly admit that. So I tend to call it Ulam Teller. The idea again is physically very interesting if we, if we think only about kind of the laws of nature for a moment. The idea was not to try to ignite a fusion reaction only based on the very high temperatures released by a, a fission bomb, but actually using radiation pressure. So these fission bombs give out tons of, of very high energy X-ray radiation in addition to producing a lot of heat. The earlier efforts to try to cook, to try to start a fusion reaction going, fusing very light nuclei together and thereby releasing energy, had all relied on heating the fusion fuel to very high energies and using a, a, a nuclear weapon fission bomb as a so-called trigger to heat up the fusion fuel. And none of them seemed to work. You couldn't heat it fast enough or all these kinds of, of concerns. They didn't seem to be feasible. And what uh, Ulam and Teller together really uh, put forward was that those fission bombs do more than just give off heat. They give out unbelievable amounts of very high energy radiation, X-rays that people knew you know, since long before uh, Compton scattering days, that radiation carries momentum. It, it, it can exert pressure. So then they realized if they could begin building a kind of cylindrical design and channel or kind of focus that very high intensity, very high energy radiation from this trigger, this fission bomb trigger, explode a, a, a kind of plutonium bomb at, uh, at one end of a cylinder and funnel or lens the X-rays onto the, the fusion fuel, then it actually might ignite the fuel and might require much, much less tritium uh, because the reaction might, might be more likely to get started. That was still just literally a thought. That was certainly not uh, proven to me, but it was a new, the first new kind of conceptual insight uh, after years of thinking about hydrogen weapons. So again, just the timeline I find just astonishingly fast. We saw Truman makes this announcement on the very last day of January, 1950. A little over a year later, still of course top secret, 
uh, Stan Ulam and Edward Teller introduced this really quite compellingly new idea to at least start working on, will it work, won't it work? <clears throat> About a year, uh, a little more than a year after that, the US establishes a second full-scale top secret nuclear weapons lab uh, in California, not too far from Berkeley in Livermore, California, largely at the urging and the lobbying of Edward Teller and, and other uh, uh, political allies. So now we have, so there was Los Alamos at, operating at full tilt plus the second lab at Livermore and the, and the kind of uh, gallows humor, the joke soon developed at Livermore that the main competition was actually Los Alamos, that the Soviets weren't the competition. The second lab had to prove its worth vis-a-vis -vis the first lab. There's a real internal rivalry, much like kind of army versus air force and navy and all these kinds of things. And they, again, just remarkably quickly in November of 52, so a year and a half after this first kind of sketch of a new idea to proceed, the first working uh, hydrogen bomb device uh, was detonated by the US in uh, the Pacific on uh, the Enoetak Atoll uh, with uh, an explosive yield that was indeed a thousand times more powerful than the bombs that have been used against both uh, about, against either Hiroshima or Nagasaki. So the, war, the wartime fission bombs were measuring outputs in the sort of tens of thousands of kilotons, or sorry, tens of thousands of tons, so tens of kilotons of conventional uh, TNT. And these hydrogen bombs were setting the scale uh, up by a factor of a thousand. The first one ever tested had an a, a, a explosive yield of uh, more than 10 million tons equivalent of TNT. And then again, as you probably know, that was just the beginning of an enormous race of doing above ground nuclear tests between the US and the Soviet Union and eventually other countries as well, France and, uh, and, uh, and, and, other, and, and other countries, Britain and, and, and some others where it gets more, more um, not so clear who's doing what when. But certainly in these early years, mostly the US and the Soviet Union. This is a plot just of the number of above ground tests, not even including their uh, yield or their radioactive fall or anything else. As you can see, the US was doing, uh, the, this is the Trinity test. That's the first, these are only test detonations. Here's the one in 1945, several more in 1946, the first Soviet test in 1949. By the time we get to the mid 1950s, the US conducted nearly 80 above ground nuclear tests in that year alone. That's more than one per week. That's extraordinary, the pace of this. And almost all of these now were variations of the hydrogen bombs, no longer are these, these seemingly small, not so small, but by comparison, small fission bombs. And then again, you see a brief pause here and then uh, another huge um, uh, expansion of the above ground testing regime. Now, let me pause there, take a few questions and I'll get to the last part real quickly. Um, Jade uh, asked what happened in the pause. Do you mean the pause in the testing? Uh, we'll come to that in a moment. So that, that's a great question, we'll, we'll see in a second. Um, Yes, yeah, so, so very good question. Uh, did the notion of physicists having these kind of warped or unbalanced educational backgrounds affect their perceived credibility? It did in some, in some corners. So many people who were either career politicians or career military strategists uh, said, well, perhaps with good reason, that why should I listen to any of these funny college professors? That's usually a fair comment. Uh, you know, they, they've never had, they have no experience with say military strategy, for example or with um, you know, procurements or, or the supply chain or anything like that. So there were plenty of arguments that, that came down to basically these people don't have sufficient relevant expertise. And that's a perfectly valid critique, I think. It was also often used selectively because they didn't seem to make that critique against physicists like Edward Teller, who, who were arguing a position that was more in line with, with their own position. So again, they, I think that argument has merit and it was also nonetheless deployed kind of selectively or, or strategically. So uh, that argument was made. It's not an invalid argument. And yet again, its actual usage was in hindsight, maybe not so clear cut as, as, as it could have been. Uh, there were other, and for example, there were plenty of university chemists and physicists who were advocating, not just Teller, who were advocating uh, the, the aggressive development of hydrogen weapons. Uh, and they were very eagerly listened to and given credit as being sort of the relevant experts in, uh, in uh, classified congressional testimony, for example. So, so the who, who has the relevant expertise question uh, was a fair one, but again, it was used, it was deployed, let's just say, uh, in, in a variety of ways. Other questions there? I'm almost at time. Let me go through, just to start this next part. We can talk more about this uh, uh, on, in when, on uh, next week as well. 
But just to say, the, the US effort to develop more and more of these hydrogen bombs continued. Here was what turned out to have been the largest above ground test by the US ever conducted in March of 1954, the so-called Castle Bravo bomb, 50% uh, more explosive even than that first Ivy Mike shot. This one became well known for many reasons, not just because it was the kind of record holder, but also because this was a larger explosive yield than the designers had expected. In fact, more than twice as explosive as the designers themselves had predicted. And that meant that the fallout from it traveled, was, there was more radioactive debris from it and it traveled further than expected. Also, there was an unlucky break with the wind. So the effects of this above ground test in the Pacific uh, were much more extensive than anyone had planned on. And what happened was there was a Japanese commercial fishing boat, a private fishing boat, very far from the test site, but it turns out not far enough, given just how far, you see hundreds of miles, uh, the fallout eventually began to, to flow. And the, so the fallout did fall onto this fishing boat. Many people on the boat became uh, sick very quickly with radiation sickness, quite severely sick. And this was no longer kind of secret. This was now uh, people in Japan uh, who were clearly showing uh, ill effects from a US above ground test. That's the, one of the first times that questions about fallout or the dangers of radioactivity become commonly discussed in the, in the broader kind of mass media within the United States. As we've talked about a few times from Good Questions in class, it's not that no one knew about radioactivity or its dangers, but it wasn't usually talked about very broadly until events that somehow couldn't be denied media coverage like that uh, Japanese fishing boat, an accident, but a very horrible accident from that 1954 test. That begins to trigger much more kind of community activism and scientist activism against above ground testing because of the dangers of fallout. In the United States, among the most successful campaigns is, has the kind of popular face. One of the, one of the figures in front of it was no, uh, Linus Pauling, who'd already won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. He was not working on the Manhattan Project. He was an outsider scientist, but a very smart one who was also very media savvy. And he was among the first to draft these kind of large scale um, uh, petitions uh, with many other leading public figures to stop um, above ground testing. Another, I think just completely fascinating example was started a few months later by a different group of several nuclear scientists, biomedical and public health experts and uh, civilians who had experience in political organizing, members of the local League of Women Voters, for example, but otherwise were not scientists in the St. Louis area. They called themselves the Committee for Nuclear Information. And they began this very famous baby tooth survey. I don't know if any of you will have heard of it. Um, the idea was that the, because of all the above ground testing, much of it within the continental United States, not just far away from the US uh, in these Pacific Islands, but even lots of tests at the Nevada test site and elsewhere, that we were in a sense bombing our own population, not with the immediate blast, but with these long-term and potentially long-lived effects of radioactive fallout. And as Evidence of that, uh, certain, um, uh, the idea was that radioactive fallout would, would land in the grass, the cows would graze, their milk would carry uh, uh, radioactive elements, children would drink the milk, and it would be taken up in, in the bones. It would be taken up in everyone's bones, but children's bones were especially easy to access because they lose their baby teeth. So here you have this perfect reservoir of, of calcium uh, rich bone material from humans that's absorbing some of these radioactive fallout elements like strontium-90, which were already by then known to be pretty bad, iodine isotopes as well. So the idea was brilliant. Send us your children's baby teeth. With, we'll send you these standardized kind of little information cards. Send us literally the teeth and we can test them in, in the St. Louis Washington University Laboratory and see just how extensive the radiation poisoning of the, of the US continental the United States has been due to the US's own above ground testing. That was a brilliant political maneuver. Uh, and you can see it was this mixture of kind of, we might today call it kind of citizen science, but it took some real political acumen from the League of Women Voters volunteers, as well as from these concerned scientists. Uh, and then this led to thing, finally led to uh, a, a unilateral moratorium on US testing starting in 58 in direct response to that. The US stopped testing while the Soviets didn't stop. Uh, but then the US went back to testing once the Soviets uh, started testing more and more massive weapons. And the real pause came actually after the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962, which seemed to have really shocked enough highly placed people both in the United States and the Soviet Union. And that led fairly swiftly 
to uh, the signing of the limited test ban treaty. It was called limited because it limited above ground testing. It drove all testing underground of which then they continued extensively uh, for decades. But the idea was to stop at least the previous pattern of 80 or more above ground tests in a given year. It really took a series of citizen uh, activism, scientists getting involved on many fronts, as well as um, these really, I think, quite chilling and very dangerous kind of nuclear standoffs, all these kind of coming together by the early 1960s to lead to uh, a sense that nuke, above ground nuclear testing uh, was, was to be stopped. Let me pause there uh, just to say that these next few slides are, are just to say the debates didn't end with that. It was then debates about delivery mechanisms, about missiles, about how many warheads should be on a missile. Uh, should there be anti-missile, anti-ballistic missile systems and so on. Here's a preview for that next film. Because of all of this above ground testing before it was driven underground, there's to this day lingering if, ill effects throughout, for example, the continental United States, they're not limited to that. Uh, where 3,000 square miles of the continental United States have now by the US federal government be de been deemed officially uninhabitable because the, the remnant radiation levels are still too high. And that's the kind of thing that this next film called Containment uh, tells us much more about. So the, the long, longer, the decades long, and ultimately in this case, um, uh, you know, thousands of millennia long, uh, environmental impacts of this relatively brief period of Cold War nuclear activity, that, that leaves a tail much, much longer than only the kind of early tests and early test bans. And that's just a preview for the film. So finally, just the last slide, that these nuclear issues have never been outside of society. I guess that should be obvious. But, uh, but the, the scientific debates, which were difficult and sometimes conceptually very rich, they were not happening in, in a vacuum. And nor were changing notions of what scientists' own roles can or should be. Are they subject to special scrutiny because they're somehow the wizards of, of dangerous materials? Are they politically naive and therefore shouldn't be trusted? Should they be speaking out because they have special insider knowledge? We haven't resolved these questions to this day, but they get really churned up and really amplified as, as burning questions, I think, during this period uh, of, of the early and mid Cold War. So those are themes we can, again, continue to think about uh, later in the term. So again, I'm sorry to run a little bit long. I'd be glad to stay late and answer questions, but that's what I want to, to, to get across for now. Yavo asks, was there competition similar to Livermore, uh, Las Alamos during the Manhattan Project? No, in that case, it really was just the Manhattan Project. Um, it there were different facilities that were not doing the same thing. So in that sense, they weren't rivals. Oak Ridge was doing different things in Hanford. With Los Alamos and Livermore, they were both, they had overlapping missions, more directly um, overlapping missions. And I think that bred more of a kind of immediate rivalry. Um, so I think that was part of the difference. That's a good question. Again, sorry to run late. Uh, I'd be glad to, to stay on a bit longer if people have more questions, but uh, we, we'll delve more into this next time. Thanks everyone, stay well.